I'm escaping to the one place that hasn't been corrupted by capitalism. The Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life. It's episode 330. 330. Uh, I'm Ethan. <laughs> I'm Liam. Liam, so much to talk about this week. And as always, so many things we can't talk about right here on the first and only wrestling podcast. It's the second week of March, and we're on the road for WrestleMania, is what I was trying to say there, I think, and I forgot. <laughs> I f- forgot how words work. Uh, but it is both of those things. We- it is the second week of March. We are on the road for WrestleMania. WWE has finally pulled a trigger in their bloodline Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn storyline as that uh, marches on. And uh, just how are we feeling generally about uh, the build to WrestleMania? We'll start talking more match by match as we uh, get into talking about what happened on Raw this week. But uh, just generally, how are you feeling about Mania build? Um, I have, a, I think, a general, I would say neutral to leaning towards slightly positive uh, feeling. I don't feel like... Uh... I don't feel like anything's particularly uh, really grabbing me, but everything that they've set up so far seems like it will lead to a good wrestling match, which, uh, you know, that's a pretty important part of uh, that because that's the uh, that's the stake upon which you put all of this sizzle. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I would say I think they're doing all right. So, of course, the the headliner on uh, one of these two nights is going to be most likely the second night is Roman Reigns versus Cody Rhodes for the undisputed WWE Universal Championship. The real main event. Yes, they had both of them in the ring together kind of for the first time at last week's SmackDown in Washington, D.C. And they did a big crowd. There's no big crowds everywhere, but they did a big crowd in D.C. I was at a Raw in D.C. six years ago that had like 4,500 people there. <laughs> and they had over 10,000 people there for uh, for SmackDown on a Friday night. Uh, but uh, Roman and Cody, they're kind of slow playing that. But uh, the bloodline thing is still what is really kind of lighting people's worlds on fire. And they're slow playing that. And Kevin and Sammy still haven't gotten back together yet. But Jey Uso finally turned on Sami Zayn after a swerve on Monday Night Raw this week. How'd you feel about how all that played out? I thought it was a I thought it was a very good segment. Um I uh yeah I thought it, I thought it was good. I thought Jay uh Jay Jay did good work there. Like the actual beating itself was good. You you set up I, I have to imagine somewhere along one of these weeks here we're doing Cody, Kevin, and Sammy against the Usos and Solo, or maybe even the Usos and Roman. Um, so having Cody get involved in there, so it's all kind of mixed together, I think is is uh, is a good idea. Um, uh, yeah, it's 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 difficult for me because I sometimes I think there is a rush, and this is not just exclusive to WWE or to pro wrestling. Even I think. Um, when you are watching something, you want to sort of instantly declare it to be like the greatest thing of its generation or of all time. And yes. I think it's difficult to do that without any sort of historical perspective, um, like waiting a few years, some things. Uh, so whether that's a wrestling match like the, the Osprey and Omega match that everybody loved this year, I liked it, too. Um, you were there live for it um, or or this bloodline storyline. I think it's good. I'm enjoying it. The twists and turns have been good. I think as we talked about at the time, I would have maybe done this J turn like two weeks ago. <laughs> feel like we're still moving at a glacial pace uh, towards this, but everything they've done individually in a bottle, I think has been pretty good. And we're, we're slowly but surely putting these pieces together. So yeah, I think it's good. I think it's a little premature to declare it like the best storyline. I mean, it's probably the best storyline in WWE in a couple of years, but also like what kind of bar is that? That's <laughs> like that's fair. Oh, it's yeah. better than Randy Orton versus Alexa Bliss. Wow. What a what a feather in in Roman Reigns' cap that he's pulled that off. 
Um, yeah, so it's good. I'm enjoying it. Um, I feel like we could pick up the pace a little bit, but overall, I think it's good. Specifically, what do you think of Cody and Roman segment? They're uh, no physicality. They're just mm-hmm. like uh, being catty with each other. <laughs> yeah, it didn't feel like. And again, it's early still. We got a few more weeks here where they can get to the big. It wasn't like a big shove of the match. It was like, a, I guess it was. It was what it was presented to be, which is these these two guys who have never really interacted before, or at least not in modern modern day. This version of Cody has never interacted with this version of Roman. Um, so it was a little bit of like feeling. It felt like a feeling out process. It felt like it was a little a little stilted in some places. I didn't think there was like a great line like. Roman kind of has the little digs where he's talking about how, you know, Dusty, you know, he he's, you know, the son Dusty always wanted or whatever. But I, I, I don't know. It didn't grab me. It wasn't like immediately like, oh, my God, I can't wait for WrestleMania when that segment was over. It's like, yeah, OK, these guys are both pretty good. And they talked for a few minutes and then it was over. <laughs> yeah. Um, kind of tidy up the SmackDown side of the card here. Uh, Charlotte and Rhea Ripley, they... I don't know. Nothing that they've done for this has uh, lit my world on fire so far. Although there still, still are several weeks of television for them to fix that. But uh, mm-hmm. the Dom-Charlotte thing, like in theory, I thought was a cool segment, but maybe in, in, in practicality, yeah, it didn't make me want to see Rhea Ripley wrestle Charlotte Flair. No, it was uh, like, yeah, there's a thing where like sometimes Dom being having negative charisma (laughs) works for the character. Yeah. In a weird way. And then there's sometimes when he's doing a segment like this where it really stands out that he should not be in long talking segments by himself. Yeah. Um, And Charlotte is not someone while I think she is very naturally charismatic has never been a uh, you know a grade A talker herself. So sharing sure. those two up uh, to go back and forth for an extended period of time was probably not the best idea. Uh, we will know Gunther's Intercontinental Championship opponent after SmackDown this week. There's a five way to determine who will face Gunther at WrestleMania, and I guess the kind of the cross brand match here is. Uh, Bob Lashley against uh, Bray Wyatt and uh, boy howdy literally <laughs> yeah uh, turns out um, uh, Uncle Howdy I thought he was like a magic invulnerable spooky man but uh, Bob Lashley just did wrestling moves to him and just beat his ass so yeah turns out he wasn't that scary I don't know what the LA Knight and everybody's been having so much trouble with over the last few months yeah nobody's just tried punching these guys <laughs> very effective <laughs> Bobby Bobby Lashley has this phrase that he is using in every promo in this segment it's uh kid games <laughs> Ray Wyatt I'm tired of your kid games uh Captain Howdy I'm tired of your little uh Uncle Howdy you're tired of these little uh, your <laughs> little your little kid games <laughs> it's like uh I I Bobby clearly has fallen in love with this phrase somehow or has this uh it's his, it's a verbal crutch uh that, that's pretty funny yeah like you need to come up you you would hope he would come up with some some synonyms for that phrase yes <laughs> but he's just yeah he's just stuck on kid games um maybe one of the 53 writers could bring a thesaurus <laughs> to smack down next week and he can he can figure out a new way to say that but yeah. yes it's yeah. terrible it's some of the worst stuff i've ever seen and i have a lot of contempt for people that like bray wyatt and I have even more content for the people that book continue to book Bray Wyatt on these shows, but that ship has sailed. So, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty clear that the, they're just going to do whatever. Um, on the Roth side, Bianca versus Oscar. They're also kind of slow playing that. Oscar like saved Bianca this week and is doing the blue mist thing and kind of slow playing like Oscar. I don't know if she's going to go full blown heel, but eventually she's got to do something to Bianca on the right. on the ro- on the road to this match. And we still got three weeks to get there or whatever, so they'll do that. That's fine. Brock Lesnar versus Omos. Oh boy, <laughs> this is the match that Brock would rather have than than wrestle with Bray Wyatt. Okay, can't, can't blame him. <laughs> no, no, you really can't. 
Uh, Seth Rollins and Logan Paul, they will have a good match. Mm-hmm. Look, uh, they finally uh, made that official on this past week's Raw. Um, Seth has got himself over his baby face, which is pretty uh, fascinating, given that he's uh, an extremely dull human being <laughs> to, with a horrible gimmick. Mm-hmm. Uh, has somehow gotten himself over his baby face. But Logan song Paul helps, apparently. Yeah. yeah, very much so. People love sing song stuff. And Logan Paul is one of the most naturally unlikable human beings on the planet, uh, which also helps. Uh, Austin Theory and John Cena, Big Match John, returned to WWE this week. What did you think of their interaction on Raw? I think it's fascinating uh, that they chose. And again, maybe this, I'm guessing Cena doesn't get told no. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, when he wants what so but they had a a little back and forth where they uh austin theory took a shot at uh cena's bald spot which is uh you know that was a big no-no in the hulkster days which i mean and hogan was a lot more bald than <laughs> than cena is now oh much more uh but it was still a no-no so i was that was kind of funny and then uh cena fired back by pointing out that uh they pipe in crowd noise to all of austin theory's matches because nobody cares about him which um would be you know kind of a sick burn but it's also uh true um nobody cares about this guy he gets no reaction when he comes out and they pipe in crowd noise very obviously for his matches and i think it's fascinating to point that out if you're not going to stop doing that (laughs) yeah yeah definitely a bizarre way to try to sell a match it's not what i would have done (laughs) I'm not sure what I would have done. I probably wouldn't have booked these two together. Yeah, I mean, I mean obviously they have decided. We've talked about this. They've decided <laughs> Austin Theory is going to happen, whether anyone wants it to or not. Um, and that's fine. But it's it's one thing to just do like a fake it till you make it and pretend, <laughs> pretend that he's great and pretend that people care. It's yes. another thing entirely to to have somebody uh, point out hey, this guy sucks and everybody thinks he sucks and nobody cares about him, um, yet you still get pushed on the show. It's very weird to do that uh, if you're trying to... If the end result here is uh, Austin Theory beats John Cena, um, which for Austin Theory's sake, you hope so, um, uh, What is where do, where do we leave that? Is that suddenly make him a, a real star after that, after he's beaten Cena? I guess that's the hope. But to me, it's like the night after WrestleMania, you're still going to have the same problem <laughs> once scene is gone and, and theory is back to chin locking Dolph Ziggler or whoever he feuds with next. I can understand why why they want to go with theory. I don't think he's bad. He kind of moves like a pro wrestler should move, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, Uh He's kind of good at some wrestling things. Um, but like if I had in this analogy, um, 1993 Hulk Hogan is John Cena and Austin Theory is 1993 Lex Luger in this analogy. It's mm-hmm. like I'm not sure I would have booked 1993 Lex Luger to beat 1993 Hulk Hogan. It's like the similarities are too. <laughs> The match doesn't work for me because it's like, well, this guy is clearly just the next version of this guy. But you already had the superior version of this guy. <laughs> so it's right. Like, I, I don't know. That's just one of many reasons why I don't like this match. Mm-hmm. But uh, I mean, John ain't winning. It's like, but John's got to win one of these. Right. <laughs> right. He's just been coming back for, for one or two matches a year now for, for five years. And he loses all of them, except for the, uh, the SmackDown uh, tag match he did right. last year. But I would like John to win a match once in a while. I think is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah. I mean, theoretically it would mean a little bit more the next time he did lose. If he won one once in a while. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's not a, like it's a, this is this is probably the match on the card I'm least excited for. Um because I yeah, it's I feel like it's a waste of John Cena uh who doesn't wrestle very often anymore. And I don't like the crowds at Raw every week. I don't I I don't really care 
uh, one way or the other about Austin Theory. So, uh, yeah, the like I said, they, they got a few weeks, so maybe they can come up with something to really get people invested in it. But uh, it's not looking promising based on that first exchange. There's also the thing with John's matches now where he he can't take bumps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so whether it's uh, an insurance thing uh, for his his Hollywood career or whether it's just he's physically done, uh, he doesn't take bumps anymore. <laughs> so how do you do a match where a guy can't take no bumps? You, he gives him <laughs> a big punch and then he, he sits down and then you put him in a chin lock. It's the damnedest thing you ever saw. It's like mm -hmm. how I don't know how you how you do a, a match <laughs> with a guy who can't take bumps, but I don't know. We'll see. Um, hey, Trish Stratus is coming out of retirement for the first time in three and a half years, uh, almost four years. She'll be teaming with my friend Amy and Becky Lynch <laughs> against Damage Control. It's interesting. They have two nights of WrestleMania, so. I assume that Rhonda and, and Shayna are still going to get a crack at the tag team titles at some point. I think maybe Alita and Becky will still lose the tag team titles at some point between now and WrestleMania. Whatever, whatever, whatever. But uh, we know he, we know a few things. <laughs> <laughs> we know that Rhonda and Becky have no interest in working with each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we know that uh, it's it's been reported that Ronda is going to be wrestling for the tag team titles at WrestleMania. And one of the people that she would have to wrestle for the tag team titles currently, uh, she doesn't want to work with. So we know there's some zigs and zags here, but obviously I'm thrilled that uh, one of my Mount Rushmore people is coming off of uh, coming out of retirement. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm. <laughs> I'm happy for you. Thanks, uh, man. Yeah, no, it'll, I like it's a, it's an exciting match, and I think even though I have been underwhelmed by Damage Control as a as a stable, I think I would chalk that more up to their booking than their um. Like we said, we felt like they they rushed right into a a title program that Bailey wasn't going to win, and through. EO and Dakota into a tag team right away. So I think they they kind of slotted them immediately at a level that hurt them, considering how much TV time they're asked to uh, eat up every week. But, uh, you know, they, they've, they've all worked hard, and it's a nice match for a lot of nice people. So isn't that just nice? <laughs> yeah, it certainly is that. <laughs> Um, let's see what else we got here. Uh, and uh, Edge and Finn are probably gonna have a Hell in a Cell match. God, oh, <laughs> program that won't end. It's gonna go 45 <laughs> minutes. Oh, it's not gonna be any good. Remember when Edge and AJ wrestled at last year's meeting? Oh, AJ Styles is not, is he hurt? He's hurt, yeah. Okay. He like uh broke his ankle or something. Okay, well, you know, he's like 50 now, so that makes sense. Yeah, the good brothers. Tri triumphant <laughs> return has been derailed um couldn't happen to nicer guys yeah absolutely but uh but yeah remember last year edge and aj had like a terrible boring match and then this year he's gonna have he's just collecting you gotta hope kenny goes to wwe so that uh edge can co complete the trifecta of boring wrestlemania matches with former bullet club guys yeah edge Edge. Adam the actor. Edge should have stayed retired. Maybe he's going to retire again after SummerSlam this year. Well, we can only hope. Although FDR Bald is threatening me that he's going to go to AEW and team with Christian again. And uh, there's a, I'm scared. There is that possibility. Yeah. We'll see. Uh, anyway, transitioning here to AEW, FTR did return this week. They returned at the pay-per-view i think mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh revolution critically acclaimed show mm -hmm. 60 minute iron man match mjf retained over danielson in sudden death that's the uh the headliner there what'd you think of revolution yeah i thought it was a a mostly very good show um a couple of those middle of the card matches you probably could have moved to like rampage <laughs> or something but uh yeah the i thought the the hangman moxie match was uh you know a fantastic bit of violence more bricks involved than i would have expected 
but uh, but I thought that was really good. Uh, I liked the the tag title match. I liked the uh, and uh, and the main event was was I thought very very good. Uh, sixty minute matches. We've talked about this before. Uh, I don't advocate that any uh, matches go sixty minutes, but I specifically uh, don't like Iron Man matches because then the crowd knows that it's going sixty minutes, and it just feels like you're handicapping the guys in there. Um, luckily. Uh, one of the guys in the match is maybe the greatest professional wrestler of the last three decades. Um, and, uh, and the other guy is, is pretty good too. So they were able to keep the crowd pretty engrossed and uh, keep them involved and, you know, take everybody on a ride. Um, I, you know, I didn't, I don't need any matches to go as long as this match goes, but as far as dealing with the Iron Man stipulation, which can be more of an albatross than a help a lot of times, uh, I thought they did. They knocked it out of the park. And uh, yeah, it was it was really good. And then it was and then I was like, oh, it's midnight and I have to work in the morning. So <laughs> right. there is there is that part of it, which is, again, uh, par for the course with aew's pay-per-views although normally they do run them on either holiday weekends or i think the november one is usually on a saturday so uh at least usually i have one one day to recover (laughs) after aew shows but not the case with this march one so uh, a good show probably too long um but a lot of very good wrestling and it's not this seems to happen a lot with aew shows which is the build going in is very lackluster and people are kind of down on it. And then there's, uh, you know, some really fantastic wrestling on the show and people that did buy the show feel like they got their, their money's worth. So if you're asking people to spend 50 bucks uh, in this modern era on a show, you better deliver some really good wrestling beyond what you can see on any given Wednesday night. So, and I think they did that at least with the, with the main event and, maybe the the extra violence you got in the Moxley match. Isn't that kind of the story of AEW, by the way? Is that the creative kind of underwhelms everyone and then the in-ring delivers? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Which to me is a more desirable <laughs> thing than the opposite. But it is, it is a it is not a new problem for them, to your point. Sure. Uh, Ricky Starks beat Jericho and then was immediately moved into a feud with Juice Robinson. <laughs> that crowd really thought when that Bullet Club song played, they thought it was Jay White. <laughs> Boy, were <Poor> they... guys. <laughs> Boy, were they wrong. <laughs> Poor unfortunate souls. Uh, I like is... your friend Juice is fine. I, I don't mind Juice. He was very nice when I met him. He mm-hmm. was very nice. I love I loved his babyface run in in New Japan a couple of years ago. I liked him when he was like the U.S. champion. Um, uh, this version of Juice, I I'll just say I haven't seen enough of this version <laughs> of Juice to he's make a just... strong uh, opinion. But also, it feels like a guy. He feels like he's a Bob Armstrong. <laughs> Like you know what I mean? Like what? there's a those guy or like a Hugh Morris, like a guy that Brad Armstrong or Brad Armstrong, yeah, whatever, yeah. one of them, uh, one of the Armstrongs that just like hung around WCW and was v- very good and solid in the ring, but also it's like he wrestles almost exclusively on WCW Saturday Night. Yeah, it's like it's like yeah, Juice is good and he's a you know charismatic guy, but I don't really don't really see this as like a guy that's gonna captivate the the larger television audience part of this specific gimmick is the problem because it's uh, it's comedy (laughs) he's just screaming all the time in in his muppet voice about how (laughs) about how he's rock hard Mm -hmm. it's like well Mm -hmm. that's comedy and also they've beaten him every time he's ever been on AEW television (laughs) it's true (laughs) who like who could possibly care uh, the Jungle Boy defeated Christian Cage in a match that everyone seemed to like. Mm-hmm. Uh, the House of Black won the trios titles. And um, I just, by process of elimination, figured that Jericho was going to be involved in the program for the trios titles. And then on Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, they're doing 
the House of Black versus the Elite versus Jericho and uh, Guevara and Garcia for the trio's title. So in Winnipeg, so that should be fun. Yeah, um, it was a very good match. I I don't care for the House of Black as an act, but uh, don't don't complain about them when they're when they're just wrestling. So and it, you know, it, you you probably needed them to win if you're going to have them around as a trio. And theoretically, it they they teased because they had Don Callis cut Kenny off in his promo the following Wednesday. So they're doing something where I think maybe Kenny's not going to be in a trio going forward. Whether or not that I don't know if he would turn on the Bucks and then the Bucks go with Hangman, or if they just kind of go their separate ways peacefully and and Kenny goes back to the singles division or whatever. But feels like Kenny and the Bucks as a trio is probably not long for this world on on AEW television at least as far as like going for the belts might depend if kenny's gonna be in the company or not it's true i mean it seems like officially unofficially depending on who you ask he's here through november right right yeah interesting jamie hater retained and then ruby soho turned on the originals Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i liked ruby's promo on dynamite to follow that up. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't care about where anyone's allegiances <laughs> lie in this program. I like all the individual talent, but I don't mm-hmm. care. Or, I don't care about anyone's allegiances. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I give Ruby credit because uh, she got more heat for that promo than I think <laughs> Soraya or Tony have gotten in the, eight weeks or whatever they've been in a heel act on this show yeah so giving them someone who is more maybe more comfortable in like a traditional u.s pro wrestling talking role yeah um probably not a bad idea so yeah let let ruby talk for the group and and then they name check statlander so i wonder if she'll be back and again i i assume we're still headed towards a a, a women's blood and guts down the line, but we'll see. Sounds like a terrible idea, but yeah, you're probably right. Um, Hangman and Mox in a Texas death match. It's like, well, how could this possibly continue after? <laughs> <laughs> and then it continued on dynamite with Moxley and the Blackpool combat club apparently turned heel. But the, I know they don't do baby faces and heels except when they do. But right, sure came off like a uh, Moxley Claudio Wheeler heel turn on Hanger and the Dark Order. That's I don't know. I took it. Yeah, and I took it as like, well, we're gonna get some more trios, uh, we're, or we're gonna get some trios matches out of this, and then maybe uh, the winner will go fight the House of Black or the Elite or whoever comes out of the other trios program with the titles. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I guess that that makes sense. In yeah, I I I thought it was crazy that they <laughs> because what more could John Moxley and Hangman Page do to each other uh, post that match on uh, on on Sunday? Um, and they've also protected Moxley so much that when Hangman gets a, like two singles win over the guy, it's like, well, Hangman's probably either the next pay-per-view program or a tv program on the way to the next pay-per-view program so right. it's, well, i would have thought that hangman would have been wrestling mjf here pretty soon but maybe not i don't know yeah that's kind of where i thought based on that because yes he he literally that was the finish he literally hung <laughs> the hangman hung someone for the first time in like <laughs> eight years um and and yeah, to get that uh, that decisive of a victory over over the the tippy top guy in AEW uh, felt like uh, felt like a big deal. And then so just to have another match, it would be one thing I think because it felt like to an extent at first I thought okay they're kind of shifting this to a dark order Blackpool Combat Club to try to build off that Moxley and Uno match they had where Moxley. <laughs> Where Moxley tried to murder Evil Uno, yeah. um, but then Hangman got involved and got laid out. So it's like he's got to be involved. And then do Blackpool Combat Club get a fourth guy then, or 
Does does Al know. or do Alex or or Uno have to just like stand impotently on the sides while the three got the other three fight? I mean, Uno could is probably best served standing, <laughs> standing in an unemployment line, but standing oh, come away on. from the people seem to like him mm-hmm. because he's polite and rarely late. But I don't, I, he, I don't. He's a guy though that found found like non wrestling roles in the company, so he's also a smart guy for that. You'd think he'd be the manager guy, yeah. In, in this program, anyway. Uh, Wardlow won the TNT title. What a whirlwind that week this guy had. <laughs> Poor fella. He taps out Samoa Joe or uh, chokes out Samoa Joe. I guess uh, it was a uh, the ref called it. I guess Joe didn't tap. But mm-hmm. for the TNT title, he wins the TNT title. He goes to the press scrum afterwards and says he wants to be the first guy to hold the TNT title and the AEW world title at the same time. Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. Tuesday. That's Sunday. That's that's Sunday night. He wins the TNT title, says he's going to be the guy. Tuesday night, he has his car broken into, and they steal everything he owns, including all of his gear mm. and the TNT title. And then Wednesday at Dynamite, he loses the TNT <laughs> title to Powerhouse Hobbs and QT Marshall. Mm-hmm. They they cuckolded Wardlow <laughs> again, <laughs> two years in a row. They cucked this guy. Mm-hmm. He gets his big moment, and then it's immediately <laughs> taken away from him. <laughs> what the hell? What did I, he do? Well, who did? He, what did he do to the Khan family? I, that's a good question. He's he's a Cody guy. Maybe there's a maybe he's being punished. <laughs> QT runs Cody's school. I know. I, <laughs> there's no, there's no reason this makes sense. Other than that, they wanted, they didn't want Will to beat Joe, which I don't know why not. Other than I guess they're both heels, um, and also maybe they wanted to close off Joe and Wardlow, so at least Joe got his revenge on, or so Wardlow got his revenge on Joe. But yeah, it was just what a. <laughs> This poor fella. <laughs> you know what I was thinking? There's no going back, right? There's no toothpaste back in the tube for this. It's right. going to be a long time, if ever, that you can rebuild Wardlow into like a top singles guy. But you know what AEW doesn't have right now? They don't have a Road Warriors, like big muscle head tag team. Yeah. So put him and Lance Archer together. Just let them let him squash guys for a while and then build them up for whoever the tag champs are. I mean, it's a perfectly fine idea. Um, although I don't know why anyone would ever care to see world though again after, <laughs> after, after the way he, lo- the fact that he lost and the manner in which he lost. On yes. Dynamite. He got hit in the back. Of QT <laughs> Marshall with the lightest chair shot you've ever seen. And then got kind of awkwardly power bombed off a of stage. And uh, and got ten counted. He got ten counted in a balls count anywhere match. Yeah. <laughs> also, I didn't understand, or I've never seen that. that was, yeah, that was a real WCW or TNA thing where they just. Oh, by the way, this also has a a ten count rule now. Oh, all right. <laughs> Do all matches have a ten count rule now? I I I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know. M- uh, Danielson, like in a backstage promo that was taped on Sunday, uh, retired on this <laughs> show. And he the said he's going home, which people think he's going to ROH, which don't do that. <sighs> don't waste the last full time years of the greatest wrestler of his generation's time on an honor club show. I beg of you. <laughs> it's not a good idea. That's not a good idea. And MJF, the uh, world champion. Uh, also appeared on this show via pre-tape from mm-hmm. Sunday. So interesting dynamite. <laughs> interesting dynamite. Yeah. I was just cackling at the fact that they killed Wardlow the way that they did. <laughs> it does feel personal. <laughs> <laughs> yes. They've like also it. they've also leveled up the sorry, I don't mean to cut you off if you want to talk more mm-hmm. about Wardlow. 
but they've also uh, leveled up the All Atlantic Championship. <laughs> but thanks to Shazam, it is thanks. now the International Championship. Thanks to Shazam, Fury of the Gods in theaters March seventeenth, <laughs> and and AEW's partners at Warner Brothers Discovery, the All Atlantic Championship has been leveled up into the International Championship. Uh, yes, it's very exciting. I will say uh, they're giving me Jeff Jarrett versus Orange Cassidy, which is maybe my most anticipated match of this entire year so far. Um, so I'm very excited for that. And hey, if you looked at those ratings this week, not a great week for AEW. Good week if you're Orange Cassidy, though, because people care about his matches. <laughs> and those are those were like some of the only segments that went up as they went uh, was was that long match he had with Jay Lethal. He's been in the opening segment of the show for like four weeks in a row now. And that's the typically the highest rated segment of the show. So it's like, well, is that causation or correlation? I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, but uh, I really liked Orange and Lethal, uh, the match that they had on Dynamite this week. I thought it was really good. It's, it's one of those matches that I think you could put that in like any era and any company and it works. Yeah, maybe that's why I liked it, because it wasn't so overtly AEW. <laughs> that's fair. Yeah, I mean, but it that that kind of stuff sticks out. It's one of the things that why I think the the Cody verse was always so entertaining when he was in AEW it was like it's so wacky and like completely its own thing and doesn't really jive with anything else they do. And Orange fits in a little better than, than, than Cody. Cody than Cody's <laughs> stuff did by the end there. Um, yeah. Uh, but uh, but there is something to the fact that if everybody else is doing anything is doing, you know, the PWG SoCal indie style matches, and then you come out doing some really basic old school pro wrestling, your matches are going to stand out as very unique. And th- and I think because you have a character, if you sent Juice Robinson and Mike <laughs> Bennett out to have this match, <laughs> two people that I think are great nice nice fellas and are good wrestlers but nobody yeah. would, nobody would care about this match nobody would be talking about it as a great match right but you had a character in Arch Cassidy that people care about and lethal I think by association with Jeff Jarrett is people care about that act as well now more than they did when it was just Jay Lethal and and Sanjay by themselves certainly so uh yeah you had two two acts that people care about doing like a, a completely different type of match than you normally see on this show and uh, you know, crowd was into it, and seemed like the viewers at home again. Who knows? It's trying to predict television ratings uh, for wrestling in the modern era feels like a fool's errand. But uh, it seemed like people people enjoyed it because it was different, and because they care about Orange Cassidy as a character. Orange more than held up his end of that match, by the way. Like I know he's good, mm-hmm. but sometimes I'm not sure how good he is. <laughs> As far as it being an in the ring technical pro wrestler, I'm not talking mm-hmm. about the character. The character's great, but sure, he he more than held up his end of that one. He was really good in that too. Absolutely. All right, going forward here, what else do we have? The cover around the world, New Japan Cups going on. No one cares about that. <laughs> and uh, uh, Mercedes Mo- Money's next opponent uh, will be AZM at uh, Sakura Genesis on April 8th, and then. Um, Mayu Iwatani on a stardom show on April 23rd. There's talk of making that a three way. Um, but currently, uh, Mercedes Money is uh has two more dates for sure with New Japan and stardom uh next month. So, uh, yeah, that's what's new there. And I know you wanted to discuss that uh, the XFL has a new tequila sponsor. I just I wonder it must have been a really tough negotiation uh, between Dwayne Johnson uh, and Dwayne Johnson as as after what I'm sure was bids from every major tequila brand. You know how sports leagues always have an official tequila brand. Um, Well, this the XFL does. (laughs) Sure. And that official tequila brand is Dwayne Johnson's tequila brand uh, for Dwayne Johnson's football league that uh, nobody seems to be watching or even aware of. But, uh, you know, I assume this is in some way a tax shelter for Dwayne Johnson and Danny Garcia, so good for them. 
XFL ratings are not good, but uh, Dwayne is talking about how uh, they're so good that they're being moved to bigger to bigger networks. <laughs> He's very online. For a guy who's so image conscious, it's been a, kind of a bad three or four months for for Dwayne as far as his image goes. I was going to say it feels like yeah, it's one of those snowball things where I think norm like normal, not very online people still love Dwayne Johnson as a brand. Sure, sure. But I think yes, being that he very clearly pays attention to like Twitter and Instagram and stuff, that that world is getting a little sick of him and is noticing his <laughs> his lack of success at the at the recent box office plus now this league that he bought and put his face and and his brand behind for the last last couple of years to relaunch it isn't going well like oh he's aware <laughs> he's he's aware and he wants everyone to know that he's not mad about it that's right yeah that's right all right anything else no, I always like to end on a note about something about Dwayne Johnson that irked me. So we uh, right. we wrapped it. We put a nice little bow on this. All right, good times. All right, till next time, everyone. I'm Ethan and I'm Liam. We'll be back soon with more stories from the wrestling. Goodbye. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. <laughs> So, how's the life of the Podfather? Oh, you know, I'm just I gotta do I gotta do a bonus show this week because uh, Amazon picked up the Batman show. I saw it, that, uh, which is you know, it's good. Yeah, it's good that that has found life, and that maybe that'll happen for some of these other, except for the ones that they wrote off for tax purposes. <laughs> Those <laughs> ones can't come out. <laughs> But one of the animated films they canceled after it was finished leaked online earlier this week. So nice. Hey, maybe there's hope for that uh, Batgirl movie that's probably not even any good, but also <laughs> had Michael Keaton and J.K. Simmons in it. So, you know, <laughs> and Brendan <laughs> Fraser. <laughs> How bad could it have been? Right. Special <laughs> Olympics winner, Brendan Fraser. <laughs> right. We, we like to treat Brendan Fraser. <laughs> Like he's a make a wish kid and he has two weeks to live. <laughs> the Yoshihashi of Hollywood. <laughs> oh, I just, yeah, when you go like, oh no, this Batgirl movie was so bad, we couldn't release it. It's like, I mean, I've seen what DC movies ha- they have released, I've seen but, all of them. <laughs> right, right. Most of them weren't very good. So. Right. How bad could this one have been? But also maybe don't spend $80 million on a Batgirl movie that's going straight to streaming. Yeah, that seems like poor form. But then, what, what? then Netflix is spending $130 million on <laughs> romantic comedy that no one will watch. It's like that drill tweet about how much he spends on candles and his, <laughs> his, his family's going bankrupt. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Someone, someone help me with my budget and like, spend less on candles. No. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is people sharing passwords. Clearly. <laughs> it's not that we paid The Rock and Gal Gadot and Ryan Reynolds $155 million to be in a movie that no one watched. Right. Ooh, classic. It's good. What was, yeah. it, was, what was the animated movie that leaked? Uh, it was a Scooby Doo meets Crypto the Super Dog movie. Oh, sounds terrible. Yes, but I was hoping it was going to be cool. <laughs> uh, I think it's yeah. I think it's the so it's based on the crypto cartoon that was like a very young children cartoon. So there's oh. some nostalgia <laughs> uh, wrapped up in it because it's more than five years old. Uh. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I did. Uh, I, I'm not. I'm not chopping at the bit to watch that one. But when mm. I saw that, I was like, "Hey, maybe some of this stuff, maybe some of the, <laughs> maybe some of the good stuff will get leaked too." Mm.
I was going to say, I think I cut you off with that question. Oh, I forget now. Um, but I, I was just thinking, based on the fact they've now axed this Batgirl movie, and they, so the Aquaman movie was supposed to have uh, a Batman cameo at the end to, I guess, set up another <laughs> sequel or a Justice League movie. Uh-huh. So they had Michael Keaton film it because at the time the plan was Keaton's going to be Batman in the main universe after the Flash movie. Right. And then they're like, wait, we shuffled everything around. Aquaman's coming out first. So we need to shoot a scene with Ben Affleck instead. So they shot that. And now not only is Aquaman coming out after the Flash again, probably neither of those scenes are going to be in Aquaman <laughs> because the universe is ending. <laughs> Oh, beautiful. They, uh... so they got Michael Keaton back and they just jerked him around for three years <laughs> and made him put on that stupid rubber suit <laughs> and film a million scenes with a bunch of in- multiverse dialogue he did not understand. Right. And then, and then well, like, I mean, I guess he gets paid either way, so maybe he doesn't care. <laughs> right. I mean, there's a quote from him where he's like, uh, someone asked him if he regretted not doing the third uh what became Batman Forever? Right. He was like, um, no. But <laughs> there was there was this time where a friend of mine was going in on a real estate thing, and I didn't have the bread, so uh, you know, I kind of wished I had done it then. But that's the only time. <laughs> it's not a bad Michael Keaton yet. You got Thank there. You. Thank you. I got I got to work on it a little bit. He's just he feels he's a jazz man. I feel like he's like he's really yep. He's vibrating at a different, uh, not at, not at a normal uh, frequency like the rest of us are. There's like a little, there's a little bit of a, a weird tilt to to your head when you talk like Michael Keaton. Yes, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. The episode of Frasier where he plays uh, a Frasier's ex brother in law who's a scam artist aired recently as it always does. It's <laughs> tremendous. <All> right. <laughs> He's uh, pretending to be uh, in a wheelchair the whole time. And then he's like a uh, television televangelist. And uh, Frazier goes up to expose him. Frazier like goes up on stage and dumps him out of the wheelchair. <laughs> and then it turns out, of course, he's actually crippled. <laughs> so then classic. But then the the the, the closing scene, uh, Frazier apologized to him and the, uh, he's leaving and uh uh, they close the door and then they open the door back up and Keaton's gone, but the wheelchair is still there. Ah. <laughs> it's like, oh, he was a scam artist all along. Double <laughs> swerve. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> all right. All right. So we got enough here? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Okay. I try to keep on keeping on.